Good morning. Unfortunately, again, we are forced to worship in this manner via Facebook Live, and we will be worshiping this way until further notice. Uh, COVID is worsening. I'm praying that this vaccine will kick in and return us to a normal life sometime this year. But until that time, we are going to continue to break the bread of life here on Facebook Live. Also, if you are watching, please let us know. Either like, leave a comment, or contact Nancy and let Nancy LeGuire and let her know that you watched and worshipped with us this morning. Again, if you are watching, just leave a note saying so-and-so is watching in the comments section or hit the like button or the love button, whichever one you would like to, to click. Let us know that you are with us. Now, before we get started, I do have something that, that I would like to say. Uh, this past week has been one of the darkest in our nation's history. We had a riotous mob attack our capital, the seat of our democracy, the seat of our democratic republic. Now, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, this was wrong. It was wrong. Five people lost their lives. The DS also made a post on Facebook and he, he made the comment that politics has become some people's God. And I totally agree. I believe that it's time that we left the donkey and, and the elephant and looked to the Lamb the Lamb of God, the light of the world. Our country needs to heal. Our people need to heal. In the name of Jesus, there has been enough hatred and lies on both sides. It must stop. Let us look to God. Let us look to Jesus. Let us cry out for forgiveness and so that our land may be healed. It was a dark week. And I pray, I pray to God that our country will find healing. It's been a dark week. And like I said, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. It was wrong. Let's stop the rhetoric. Let's stop the hatred. And let's look to the Lamb of God. Again, if, if you are watching, and I, I had to say that uh, because when I was a young man, I, I signed a contract and raised my hand and swore an oath to this country to defend it and its constitution from enemies both foreign and domestic. And watching the events of this past week hurt me to my heart. This country needs to heal. This is not the America I remember that I grew up in. Again, if you are watching, please let us know. Let us know by just saying that you're watching in the comments section or hit like. We like to, we like to keep an account of who's watching and who's worshiping with us. It is good to be able to, to come with you, come to you this morning, even if it is in this manner, to break the bread of life. I also want to thank those who continue to send their tithes and offerings to the church without you. Well, we couldn't make it without you. So continue to be loyal to God with both your gifts and and your tithes. Your offerings and tithings are an act of worship, so continue to worship God. And I pray that those that 
do continue to offer up the worship of tithing and offerings, let it be blessed. Bless all those gifts that have come and all those that are on the way and those that may not be able to give. We ask that God bless you and send you a job if that's what you need so that you can return to some type of normalcy. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this land of freedom that you have birthed us in. But sometimes even our land of freedom and democracy teeters on the brink of destruction. Father, let us look to you Let us cry out to you for a healing, for forgiveness. For those that were in Washington, Father, who marched on the Capitol, open their eyes and let them see the error of their ways. For the families of the five who were killed during this event, Lord, Touch them. Send your Holy Spirit to help their grieving hearts. Father God, touch the hearts of this grieving nation. Again, let us take our eyes off the donkey and the elephant and put them on the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Heal us, O Father. Remind us who we are. And give us the strength and the courage to act and speak. Whether it be a spoken voice or or whether it be printed text in Facebook or wherever, let us speak as you would have us speak in honesty and in words that do not hurt or degrade. Let us return to you, Father. Father, for those who are sick with COVID, Steve, Karen, and all the others who who are sick with COVID this morning, my prayer is that they are better. Lord, that is my prayer for everyone who is facing it this morning. For all the hundreds of thousands of families who have lost loved ones, my prayers and thoughts go with them. Send your Holy Spirit to go with them as well. For those who have had knee replacements and are still on the road to recovery, Father, bless and touch as only You can. Now again, Father, I lift up this country of ours. Let the hatred, the rhetoric, stop. And let us come together as a nation and as God's people. Let us cry out for forgiveness so that our land can be healed. Now, Father, you know the needs of your people. You know those that have sick loved ones. You know those that may have lost jobs or hours because of this pandemic. You know our needs. Touch and bless as only you can. And bless the offerings that we continue to receive and those that give. And those that are unable to give, pour out a double portion of blessing, Father. Now, Lord, we leave these requests spoken by me and and by all those who are at home praying as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, we claim them done. Amen. Again, it is good to see so many of you joining us this morning. I see Ray who is with us. 
and Rachel and Betty, Janice and Terry and Jack, Haskell and Linda, Carolyn Goodman, Shelby, Nancy, Myra, many of you watching this morning, and I thank you. Now, last Sunday was Epiphany Sunday, and we talked about the wise men and how wise men still seek Jesus. Didn't get to do a, a New Year's message, but this is the way it always is. We, we have the Epiphany Sunday, and, and then I always do a New Year's message. So this morning, I'm going to be talking about resolutions. It's something we all make, or have made, and have broken. Amen, or oh me, whichever one you have to say. The word will be 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. I'll be reading from the King James Version. 2 Corinthians, the second letter to the church at Corinth, chapter 5, verse 17. I will give you an extra minute or so to find it because I hope that's what you're doing. I hope you're just not relying on me to read it to you. And we're going to get into reading of the word a little later. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Just one verse today. And I will be reading the King James Version. Let us read it reverently and with respect for God's Word. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The Word of God, for us, the people of God, thanks be to God. I kind of wish this was a Zoom meeting so I could hear you saying thanks be to God back, but I, but I hope you do participate because this is worship. Now, like I said, we often make New Year's resolutions just to fine-tune what we already are. But what if God wants to make us completely different or completely new? Now, if you look up the word re resolution, it says this, a state or quality of being resolute, firm determination, a course of action determined or decided upon and resolving to do something. Now this is the time of year when, when many of us make those famous New Year's resolutions. And when we make our New Year's resolutions, we, we usually start out firmly determined. We usually start out resolutely on this new course of action. This is the year. I will lose that 20 pounds. This is the year I will stop smoking. This is the year I will do better in school. Uh, this is the year that I'll be a better parent, a better grandparent, a better friend, a better classmate, and on and on. And this is the year that I will not fall asleep in church. I'm not calling any names. And when we make these resolutions, we usually start out so very well. And we make it, usually make it through January with our resolutions still intact. But then February comes. And the newness of this resolution, it fades and the reality begins to sink in. This is hard. Oh, what I've resolved to do is hard. And it doesn't take long for us to discover or, or to rediscover a simple truth. That the words that are hardest to live by are the easiest to speak. 
I'm going to say this again. That the words that are the hardest to live by are the easiest to speak. Now when we make these resolutions, we need to do something more than improvement. We often make resolutions, and like I said, we break them. Words are, are easy to speak, and, but they're hard to live by. And really, m most of our resolutions are misplaced anyway. These resolutions are, are only designed to make us slightly better. They're only designed to, to take what we already are and, and fine-tune it, remodel it, so to speak, just a little bit. I resolve to lose 20 pounds so that I can look just a little bit slimmer. I resolve to stop smoking so that I can be just a little bit healthier. I resolve to control my temper so that I can be just a little nicer. Now don't get me wrong, these resolutions are, are great. But are these resolutions that God would have us make? Is, his, is God's goal for us by next year that we should just be slightly improved? Is his goal for us by this time next year that, that we be the same old us, just fine-tuned with the rough edges smoothed out just a little bit? Now, I'm going to answer that for you this morning, and the answer is no. That is not what God wants. He's out to do something entirely different, something far beyond minor renovations. God wants to make us completely new. He doesn't want to make just a slightly better version of what we were already. Listen to this story of a London businessman, Lindsay Clegg. He had a warehouse that he was trying to sell. And this property had been empty for a, a very long time and it needed repairs. Vandals ha had damaged the doors, smashed the windows, and strewn trash all around the interior of the old warehouse. As he showed a prospective buyer the property, Clegg took pains to say that he would replace the broken windows bring in a crew to correct any structural damage and clean out the garbage. But the buyer said, forget about the repairs. When I buy this place, I'm going to build something completely different. I don't want the building. I want the site. Now compared with the renovation that, that God has in mind, our efforts to improve our own lives is as trivial as sweeping a warehouse slated for destruction. When we become gods, the old life is over. He makes all things new. All God wants is the sight and the permission to build. And when we make these resolutions, we also need to act resolutely. If we are going to act resolutely, if we are going to be firmly determined, if we are going to set a course of action, then we should do it for something that will make great and lasting changes. Why waste time on just slight improvements when we can invest in becoming something brand new? God's not interested in, in just throwing a coat of paint on us. He's not interested in doing a little remodeling. Paint fades and chips. We need to simply resolve to give him, give him permission to, to tear down and rebuild. God's looking to work wonders in us and through us. We need to simply resolve to, to put ourselves in His hands 
and let him do the work. And resolving to do three things will put us in a place where, where God can begin to, to rebuild us, making us into something new and wonderful. Now, I want you to note here that these three things that I'm going to talk about are not the ends. They are the means to the end. We do not do these three things simply to do them. We do them with, with one thing in mind, letting God work to make us into all that he meant us to be. So here are the resolutions that I think we should make. Resolution number one. Go to church, whether it be on Facebook or when we return to normal at God's house weekly. Going to church and worshiping is, is a vital component to the Christian life. But maybe not for the reasons that some of us may think. Listen to Hebrews 10 and 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but extorting one, exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Oh, it's staggering, the excuses that we can come up with to abandon or desert fellow Christians and God on Sunday mornings. There was a song by the Kingsman many years ago, Excuses, excuses, you'll hear them every day. The devil, he'll supply them if from church you stay away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep those folks away from church, he offers them excuses. Excuses. There was a pastor also who, who talked about excuses, and he wrote the following. Football in the fall. Basketball in the winter. Baseball in the spring and the summer. Now, I, this pastor has been, and I have been also, an avid sports fan all his life. But I've had it. I quit this sports business once and for all. You can't get me near one of those places again. Want to know why? Every time I went, they asked me for money. The people I sat next to, uh, well, they didn't seem friendly at all. The seats were too hard and were not very comfortable. I went to many games, but the coach never came to my house. Then the referee made a decision that, that I thought was terrible. I also suspected that I was sitting with some hypocrites. They came to see their friends and what others were wearing rather than to see the game. Some games went into overtime, and I was late getting home. The band played some numbers that I'd never heard before. Plus, it seems that the games were always scheduled when I had other things to do. And when I was a child, my parents took me to too many games. I don't want to take my children to, to any games because I want them to choose for themselves what sport they like the best. Excuses, excuses, you'll hear them every day. The devil, he'll supply them if from church you stay away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep those folks away from church, he offers them excuses. It's funny how, how these excuses to not go to a ball game sound so crazy. But yet when they're used talking about the church, to some they make perfect sense. Rick Warren says that we are created for community, fashioned for fellowship, and formed for a family. 
None of us can fulfill God's purposes alone. We were created to have a relationship with God and our brothers and sisters in Christ. Romans 12 and 5 says, So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Paul says we're connected to each other. Every one in the body of Christ is important and necessary. When one part of the body decides to desert and, desert and abandon the other parts and disconnect, it affects all the others just as it would with the human body. What if your legs decided all of a sudden that they wanted to leave? How would that affect you? What if your eyes all of a sudden said, well, I'm going to leave too since the legs left? What would happen to the body? You cannot say that you believe in God and then not want anything to do with His body. And the church is the body of Christ. You cannot say that you love Christ without loving his body. Ephesians 2 and 19. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Realize that we are part of God's household. We are part of God's family. And in God's family, you can move from being spiritually isolated to being a part of a community. In God's family, you can chip in and do the chores that our Father gives us and become part of bettering our community. In God's family, you can be involved in a community that will encourage you, support you, but also hold you accountable. In God's family, you can help fulfill the purpose that our Father has for us, for this world. If we resolve to make church attendance or, or worship attendance, whether it be by Facebook Live or, or like I say, when we return to some sort of normalcy and are able to return to our sanctuary, if we resolve to make church attendance a priority, worship attendance, Sunday school attendance a priority, and don't let a sport, a club, a hobby, or anything else take its place, then we are doing more than, than going to a place to, to sing songs and pray and listen to a pastor preach. When we resolve to make church a priority, we are aligning ourselves with, with God's will for our lives. And we're saying, today I will not sleep in. I will not do this or do that. I will step into God's presence this day. And this day, I will become a part of something much greater than myself. When we resolve to make church a priority, we are saying, I will not abandon my brothers and my sisters. I will not desert them, no matter how flawed they are, because they need me, and I need them because I am just as flawed. When we resolve to make church a priority, we are resolving to identify ourselves with the body of Christ, to do the work God has planned for us, to take a step towards changing our lives and the lives of everyone in the world. And folks, it needs changing. And it won't be changed. And we won't be changed lying in the bed and watching television on Sunday mornings. The second resolution that I feel that we should make is to read the Word of God daily. <clears throat> Resolve to read the Word of God at the very least 15 minutes a day. I prefer you read it a whole lot more, but set a goal of at the very least 15 minutes a day or a chapter 
a day, whichever you prefer. It might take 15 minutes to read the chapter. But do this every day. And I can tell you from experience that God will use it to change your life. Absolutely guaranteed 100%. 2 Timothy, Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man or woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Former President Ronald Reagan once said, within the covers of one single book, the Bible, are all the answers to all the problems that face us today. If only we would read and believe. Ulysses S. Grant once said, Hold fast to the Bible as the sheet anchor of your liberties. Write its precepts in your hearts and practice them in your lives. Now I know someone who might see this might say, Well, read the Bible daily. Come on now, Pastor. Why is that so important? So what? A couple of dead presidents said some nice things about it. My life's going just fine without reading that book. But I want to tell you this morning that when you read the Bible, you're not just reading a book. You're discovering what God wants. When you read the Bible, you're not just looking at words on a page. You're walking, I believe, in the mind of God. When you hold the Bible in your hand, I believe that you are holding the heart of God. When you hold the Word of God, you hold God's deepest desire for your life and the lives of your children. So I believe that spending at the very least 15 minutes a day reading the Bible is spending at the very least 15 minutes a day with God. And if you do this, you will spend at least 15 minutes a day reading God's thoughts, discovering God's will, peeking into God's heart, and grabbing hold of God's deepest desire for your life. And folks, this can do nothing but benefit you. Paul says that that it leads us to a life that has God's approval and that it completely prepares us. Henry Blackaby says that Scripture is not a concept. Scripture is a person. When you stand before the Word of God, you are not merely encountering a concept. You are standing face to face with God. John 1.1 says that the Word is a person. The Word, Jesus Christ, Christ became flesh and blood and lived among us. Henry Blackaby says again, the Bible is our opportunity to know Jesus better and for him to speak to us. In the early 1980s before the fall of communism, Tatiana Gorsheva and I know I butchered that last name, was a young philosophy student at Leningrad University in Russia. She was struggling with the concept of Marxism and eventually lost confidence in it. She turned instead to existentialism. That's a word that I, I have problems pronouncing. But when that philosophy did not meet the deepest needs of her soul, she turned to yoga. Our father, I'm sorry, as one of her yoga exercises, she was told to use the Christian prayer, Our Father, as a mantra to get into a meditative state. She began to read 
and repeat the words. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. She went through the prayer five or six times and then she says, Suddenly, I was turned inside out. I understood that God exists. The living, personal God who loves me and all creatures who has created this world, who became a human being out of love, the crucified and risen God. Just by simply repeating those words, she encountered God. And these words are found within the Word of God, within the Bible. And when you read the Bible, it's meeting with God speaking with God, encountering God and His will for your life. If you're not reading the Bible, then you're not meeting with, speaking with, or encountering God and His will for your life. So resolve to read the Bible at the very least 15 minutes a day, or a whole lot more, whichever you would like, but at the very least, 15 minutes. Third and final resolution I would like to talk about this morning is to pray constantly. Now, you know, if we were in church, I would ask the question, if you can talk, raise your hands, and I'd look over at Jim and I'd tell him to raise both his hands. If you can talk, raise your hands. When we, so pray constantly, resolution number three. When we meet with God and our brothers and sisters weekly, and when we spend at the very least 15 minutes a day encountering God in His Word, that should lead us to this final resolution. Wanting to encounter God through prayer or through a conversation. We should be praying Constantly. And prayer is nothing but a conversation with God. And I, I'm going to use the letters of the word pray to describe what I feel that we should be doing. P. We should begin by praising Him. R. Repentance. Repenting for any wrong that we have done. A. Asking for others. Why? Then asking for yourself. We should be praying constantly. Look at what Paul says in one of the shortest verses in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17. And 17 Paul says, pray without ceasing. Unfortunately, most of us do not do this. Most of us pray when we're desperate or, or when our backs are against the wall. And we see this all the time, especially in the movies. Our hero or, or our heroine gets in a jam and he shouts, Lord, help me! And when he or she gets out of that predicament, forgets completely about God and goes back to life as usual. J.P. Phillips calls this God in a box. And this box is only opened in case of emergencies. Attending church in Kentucky, there was this one particular little rambunctious little boy always getting into trouble, running up and down the aisles, in, interrupting service, just fidgeting around, just aggravating everybody. His father had had enough had had enough, picked up that child and started heading towards the back door and the little boy knows what's about to happen. And no one in the congregation so much as raised an eyebrow until the child spoke from under his father's arm as he was being carried out. And he said with his Kentucky accent, Y'all pray for me now. As funny as that story may be, 
Prayer was not meant to be a, an insurance policy. Prayer was meant to be a way of life. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Martin Luther wrote, If I should neglect prayer but a single day, I should lose a great deal of the fire of faith. And in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, again, Rick Warren tells us that God has designed us to have a relationship with him. We were made for a continual relationship with God, to be continually in his presence. Adam and Eve had that, but lost it through sin. But through prayer, we can have it once more. We can't grow in our relationship with God simply by going to church for a couple of hours every week. We cannot grow in our relationship with God without constant prayer. Talk to, God, talk to people in prison about what is the hardest thing about being in, in prison. For those who are alone without loved ones, they say boredom or the food or, or the confinement or, or, or something else might be the problem. But ask someone who has a wife or a loved one or a husband, someone that they dearly love on the outside. Ask a prisoner who is separated from those loved ones what the hardest thing is and they will give you an entirely different answer. They will say that the hardest thing about being in prison is being away from those loved ones. The hardest thing is only being able to see them just once a week and only just for a few hours. These prisoners dream of freedom, not just to be free, but to be able to see, to speak to, and to hold their loved ones whenever they want. For how, however long, they want. In our relationship with God, we have put ourselves in self-imposed prison with just Sunday visiting hours. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes in our relationship with God, we have put ourselves in a self-imposed prison with just Sunday visiting hours. But folks, God wants to spend every day with us, every minute with us. He's waiting to hear from us, to talk to us about how our day was. He wants to renew us, guide us, and lead us. But all too often, we stay away from God. We come to him so infrequently, but yet he stands there with his arms wide open, waiting for us. And when we do come to him, we come with a list of requests. God, however, just wants us to come to him. Imagine if you had a friend that Every time the friend came along and they just said, would say hello and they would ask for something. Give me some food. Give me some, some money. My bag's hurting. you have, have any pain pills? Or, or give me some money to go to the chiropractor. Pretty soon you're just going to say, wait a minute. This person's just a friend just so they can get stuff from me. We only hear from them when they want something or need something. Get where I'm going with that? Let's resolve not to make this our relationship with God. Let's resolve to come constantly to God in prayer, regardless of whether we have needs or not. Let us resolve to, to just speak to Him and allow Him to, to speak to us so that he can point out areas in our lives that need to be dealt with. Let's resolve constantly to meet the one who has the power to change us into something utterly amazing.
as with all resolutions, the choice is ours. We can settle for minor repairs which will make us look a little better. Or we can settle to try to act resolutely in, in our own strength. And perhaps if we do that, we can make it to to February or even March before we fall and say, well, I'll try again next year. Or we can get serious. We can resolve to, to let God tear down our old selves and rebuild us into something completely new and something completely wonderful. We can let Him speak to us, work in us, and through us as we meet Him weekly in church together with our brothers and sisters. We can meet Him daily in His Word as we read the Bible. We can walk in His thoughts and counter His vision and will and dreams for our lives each and every day of our lives. And we can meet constantly with Him in prayer. We can live in a steady, growing relationship with Him. God's looking for a site. He's looking for permission to build something amazing. Are you available? Let 2021 be the year that you resolve to give God permission to build something amazing in you. And when we all, if you do that, when we all gather together again this time next year, you'll be able to stand and say, wow, you can't believe what God has done in me. And then everyone around will say, oh yes we can. Because He's done it for us as well. And let the church say, Amen. I want to thank you for joining us on Facebook Live. Once all this is over and we're able to join together again in our sanctuary, I'll let the sirens go by. When the pandemic is over and once again we are able to worship together in God's house. If you are watching and you do not have a home church, if you do not have a place of worship to attend, know that you are welcome at Mount Mitchell United Methodist Church. We don't care what you look like, what your social status is, we don't care. We will love you like Jesus loves you. You are welcome at Mount Mitchell United Methodist Church. Let us receive the New Year's benediction. May the God who gave us this year, and the Savior who walked at our side each and every day, and the Spirit who filled us with life abundant, grace the coming year with peace, hope, and joy. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed week. And hopefully we'll see you next Sunday right here at 11 o'clock. God bless.